Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today and allowing me to present. So I have a question for everyone today. When you look at this ratio of one in four people, what do you think it means when we're talking about uh, the problem of depopulation? The answer is that one in four young people in the three major metropolitan areas of Japan are interested in migrating to a rural area. I was quite surprised by this because if you look at the actual figures, the number of people who are migrating to rural areas is declining. So the next question is, why can't they migrate even though they have an interest? Please keep this question in mind during my talk. To begin with, I want to give a brief self-introduction. I was born in Wakayama Prefecture in a rural area south of Osaka and Kyoto. I lived there all the way through my high school years and my school years, but wanted to move to a big city, so I went to Tokyo for university and graduate school. My special area of interest and study has been social education and community development, the way people can learn through the community. I also, of course, have a special interest in how this relates with Buddhism and over the years have worked with various Buddhist educational and social development organizations. In 2016, I was able to go and work in Sri Lanka for three years for a similar Buddhist-based social development organization run by the chairman of INEB, Arsha Navaratna. My father is a priest of the Jodo Pure Land denomination, and I was born in the temple. But my mother is from a farming family in a more remote part of Wakayama. On summer vacations, we would go stay in her hometown, and I really enjoyed the quiet and beautiful rural life there. So I developed a vague sense of wanting to live this way. But when I was living in Tokyo, I had a lot of doubts about whether I could go back to the countryside and make, make a life as a farmer. These thoughts informed my decision to go to Sri Lanka and learn more about Buddhist-based rural community development, which I felt would then help me live in Wakayama, where I, had, where I have returned since I left Sri Lanka two years ago. Also, last year I was able to take full ordination as a priest in the Jodo Pure Land schools of my family temple. So these are some of the topics I would like to cover today. First, as there are a lot of viewers from overseas today, I want to explain about depopulation in Japan. Secondly, I will explain why young people have a hard time moving back to rural areas. Thirdly, I will speak about my activities in my hometown of Kimino. And then finally, I will talk about what is the ideal way of living from a Buddhist perspective. To begin to explain about urbanization and rural depopulation in Japan, one has to look at the change in industrial structure during the era of rapid economic growth in Japan after World War II, and especially during the 1960s. In order to industrialize and attain such high growth, the Japanese labor force needed to be concentrated in urban areas, which prompted a mass exodus from rural areas where most Japanese had lived. People, capital, and materials were seen as resources, and so people had to make their who had made their lives in farming or fishing became urban laborers. Some of the problems that arose from this mass urbanization have been environmental pollution, commuter, commuter congestion, increased poverty, social isolation, and social discrimination. Reverend Yoshimizu has spoken about many of these problems in his talk, so I will not go into them in detail. Simply, urban areas are artificial constructions for economic and political development, as well as intensive research. As such, humans must learn how to adjust to, rather un to their rather unnatural environments, like crowded commuter trains and roads, and working long hours into the night. In this way, cities are always ingesting and cycling through new waves of migrants, which has led to the depopulation of Jap Japan's countryside and is now starting to intake more and more foreign workers. So the cities have continued to develop and expand in size. The result of these stress factors has led to various psychological 
as well as physical illnesses. In looking at the rural side of this development, we can look at three important groups. On the top, the local government, in the middle, the local community, and at the bottom, the local temple. Concerning the first, as the rate of depopulation has increased, so has the tax burden on those people who have remained to continue to prop up community systems with their tax money. Still, the quality of public service and support continues to decline. The most serious example of this was the year when the Wak was this past year when the Wakayama provincial government said that in the next 15 years there would be a reduction in public high schools from 30 schools to 20. Although the people are quite against this. On the community level, a problem has been that more and more farms are being abandoned as their owners grow old and there are no successors. The rate of empty houses in Wakayama stands at 18.5% and these lands are becoming untended and attracting damage by wild animals. The local population will usually keep a community clean and perform local festivals, but all these community activities are dying out now. Such depopulation is obviously also having an effect on local Buddhist temples, which have fewer parishioners to support them. Among my Jodo Pure Land denomination in Wakayama, 41% of our temples do not have an active abbot. So abbots from other temples must hold multiple such positions to try to keep these temples alive. All these factors feed on each other to create a vicious cycle. So we have to ask, will the situation just continue to get worse? <clears throat> My thought is that in capitalism, the most important values or means that are used are one, rationality, two, uniformity, and three, concentration of people, resources, etc. As long as we continue to believe in these values, the congestion of our urban areas will only continue to worsen while the rural areas empty out. So the reason why young people have had a hard time moving back to rural areas is that there are no jobs, poor public transportation, and meeting daily needs seems quite inconvenient compared to cities. As long as people continue to value wage labor and consumer convenience, it will not be possible to shift to living in rural areas. But this does not mean we have to just sit back and watch this process run its course. There are actually two major factors that I think will help young people move to rural areas. The first is the realignment of the social industrial structure, and the second is the diversification of life values. In terms of the first factor, if we look at the shift in industrial culture in Japan, we see that 100 years ago, over 50% of people were engaged in primary industries which include farming, forestry, and fisheries. In the 1960s and 70s, we saw the sudden decline in such primary industry to people working in secondary industry, such as factory and construction work, as well as tertiary industry, like finance and service sectors. Finally, by 2015, the primary sector had dwindled to only 4%, and the tertiary had grown to 72%. However, in this tertiary sector, we are seeing more change and the development is of what is called the fourth industrial revolution, focused on information technology and artificial intelligence. The original core values of industrial capitalism in rationality, uniformity, and concentration do not work in this system, which tries to focus on the customization and personalization of the needs and wants of people. In this way, we can see a shift of value away from quantity and more towards the quality of things. The COVID pandemic has strongly affected the tertiary sector, which depends on the frequent movement of goods and services. And some young people have begun to question their lives working in this sector and revisit the possibility of working in the primary sector. Unfortunately, the primary sector, like farming or fishing, is hard to make money in unless you do something drastically different. Just surviving on a primary industry income is extremely difficult in this current economic system. So some people are seeing this kind of work as a hobby or just a side job. 
but still we can notice a shift in values among them, which may increase migration to rural areas. In looking at this change in values, we can note that back in the 1960s, people at first wanted to get out of such rural communities and seek for the things of a modern life, like university education, working in a well-known company, consuming name brand goods, and working hard until retirement, when one would spend their golden days enjoying what they had accumulated. But because of the increasingly precarious nature of this dream life, we are seeing a reconsideration of these values. The Japanese version of millennials in the U.S. is the Satori generation, born here between 1987 and the 1990s. This generation is known for not being so interested in consuming or possessing things, to the point that they seem enlightened to other generations and, that, and thus are called the Satori generation, for the Zen word Satori for enlightenment. They also have a stronger sense of work-life balance and not working too hard or staying with one company for too long. They're not interested in working for a famous company and may like to work one kind of job one day and switch to a different one the next day, like farming work one day and computer work the next. They speak of the U-turn of returning back to the rural area where they were born to, born to live and take care of their parents. They have a much different attitude towards marriage and family than the strict modern nuclear family model of Japan. Instead, they may choose to stay sing single, or perhaps they have come out as LGBTQ. Because of these shifts, we may indeed start to see a migration back to the rural areas. That's why I'm undertaking these two challenges in my hometown of Kimino, where depopulation is a big issue. I am doing this through the company I founded, Amrita, which is a Buddhist social enterprise. The core value of the company is Buddhism, which we emphasize. As a Buddhist priest, our values are different from those of capitalism in that we emphasize sustainable business. The three pillars of the company are Buddhism, education, and food services as mechanisms for better living. But we are not just working on the local level. We are also connecting our work with other like-minded partners all over Japan and also overseas in places like Sri Lanka and India. These are some examples of our projects. First, the production and distribution of food products from organically grown food. Secondly, importing and selling goods that are good for the environment and are managed by fair trade. Three, running a weekend cafe to share what is going on in the community about such efforts and activities. And four, supporting the development of programs on Buddhism, culture, and life in rural areas. In the end, we evaluate the work not based on its profitability, but its goodness or wholesomeness. Another project we are engaged in is reviving rice terrace farming in this place called Nakata in Wakayama. This was a farm technique that lasted 400 years, but as there are no successors to this land, the farming technology is in danger of dying out. We are trying to revive it using five different themes for the work, but I don't have the time to explain them all in detail here. So the basis for all these activities are the values of Buddhism and what it means to live by such values. The most important ones for us are the following. One, we believe it is important to take responsibility for your own actions and consumption habits by clarifying the desire inside yourself. In Buddhism, we often talk about how desire is bad, but the point is not totally eliminating desire, but properly confronting it and managing in the way you consume and live. Two, we are humans living in systems that we have created, but we should not ignore the laws of nature. If you proceed in a certain direction, especially in an unskillful way, you will have to reap the results of it. Three, in respecting harmony, this means not excluding anyone. You may have your own personality and values that differ from others. So you must realize that we are all still living together and we need to keep living in harmony. 
which is realized through the Buddhist practice of loving kindness and compassion. And finally, four, I think this is a bit challenging for us these days, but I think we should learn to accept some things that are not rational or scientific because life is not confined to just what is experienced in these realms. Thank you so much for the chance to speak today.